So, welcome. I'm Nils Karlsson at the Rots Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. And we're here to have a short interview with Professor Barry Weingast from Stanford University Hoover Institution in California. He's here in Stockholm because he's given the LIF lecture lecture yesterday. And the theme of the lecture was Reconstructing Adam Smith's Politics. And uh, that's a novel topic. Uh, Adam Smith, as you all know, is well known for the wealth of nations and how prosperity and opulence, as he said, was created in society through division of labor, free markets, competition, and so on and so forth. But Professor Barry, you have an idea that Adam Smith also has a theory of politics. I'm very curious about this. Yes, Adam Smith is not well known for his politics. As you said, he's much more well known as the father of economics, but I think he should be also known as the father of political science. That's and interesting, yes. yes. He was deeply interested in politics, and uh, at the end of his, his first book was on the theory of moral sentiments. True. Uh, and at the end of this book, he promised a second book, and the second book was not The Wealth of Nations, as it turned out, but was a book on politics, what he called jurisprudence, the theory of government law and politics. But that book was never written, is that true? Yes, that book, well, he may have written it, but and it may have been among the 16 manuscripts he had burned in the last week of his life. We're, we're not sure. So how did you reconstruct his political theory? Good question. Uh, with some difficulty, but with the aid of two sets of student notes that have been discovered over the years, one in the late 19th century and one in the middle of the 20th century. And the two student notes are from different students writing in different years uh, but they largely say the same thing, and so we have some confidence that the lecture notes represent something of what he said. And these are the so-called lectures of jurisprudence, right? Yes. Okay. Jurisprudence, his theory of law, government, history, and politics. So what's the essence of his theory of government or politics? Well, he's very much interested in the issue of liberty, and liberty is a foundation for the development of economics, and what we might today call some of the infrastructure, market infrastructure, uh, the legal market infrastructure necessary for markets to succeed. So secure property rights, freedom of contract, contract enforcement, uh, protection from predation of, of the government. So what you're saying is that Adam Smith's famous invisible hand of how the baker and the butcher and whatever, with, you know, with their self-interest and their competition and so on, who unintentionally promote the common good of wealth creation, also advocated a visible hand of politics. Yes, certainly a visible hand. And of course, as you, as you know, there's been some considerable concern as to how serious he was about the metaphor of the invisible hand, using it only three times in his corpus uh, and only once in the wealth of nations. And so it may mean something more serious to us than it did to him. So uh, this theory of, of mm -hmm. government or politics, you said uh, liberty was essential here. Mm -hmm. And what else? Security? Yes, security was a very important critical piece. Violence was a big part of his theory. Uh, uh, violence is something that m modern economics, I think, misses. It's a very important missing margin in modern economics. And it was central to Adam Smith's theory of economics and politics. I guess justice is essential here as well, right? Yes, justice is part of liberty. Yes. So liberty, security, security. And, and of course commerce and markets. Commerce, of course, which follows yes. from this institutional structure, as we would say today. Yes. And, and uh, he was critical towards other kinds of government interventions in markets and civil society, I guess. Or yes, how do well, you think here? Yes, I think very much so. You, you can think of him looking in a world of looking backwards on a world of less developed countries, and less developed countries had much more um, political control of markets, and so part of what he was talking about at the time was undoing this political control, the ne the unnecessary hindrance of the market mechanisms where they worked. Now he certainly was quite interested in you know, various aspects of public goods and regulations. You know, if you look, um, uh, I'm forgetting a famous economist uh, made a list of the, all the different times he suggests uh, intervention. Education, bridges, yeah. roads, this kind of collective goods he was yeah. also favoring. I remember yeah. that, yes. 
So this theory of government that was so essential to him and apparently to the emergence of markets and wealth and so on, how could such an order develop? Uh, you also have studied his, his writing about this. This is not well known either, I would say. Yes. Well, one of the interesting things about uh, uh, the economic study of the wealth of nations is that the economists skip all the parts that are not related directly to modern economics. Exactly. So it is a book of, uh, uh, the book itself has five parts, five okay. books. And the third is the most political, that is the most deeply about politics, and it's the one that economists tend to, tend to skip. Uh, many economists say that this is not real. This is a separate mon monograph. It's not about the wealth of nations. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter said that it was a, a deeply, it was deeply understudied and yet devoted only two other sentences to, <laughs> to it. But uh, apparently, the political scientists have missed this as well. I think that's right. I think among po political scientists, the people that study it tend to be uh, moral philosophers. And so they're interested in a very different aspect. They read a theory of moral sentiments rather than the wealth of nations. Yes. And they read the lectures on jurisprudence in that context exactly. rather than in the context of a separate uh, uh, project in and of itself. So this, you actually argue, I think, that he's like a founder of modern political science in a, in a sense too, not only yeah. economics. Yes, I think that's right. The, the way it's, it's true in a sense and false in a sense. It's true in the sense that he certainly worked on most parts of modern political science, what we consider modern political science. He asked many of the deep questions, you know, such as why are some countries to, uh, republics and others authoritarian? Com comparative politics. Comparative yes. politics, international relations. And the sense in which it's not true is that since he never published the book, he didn't become known. He wasn't able to teach people in the way that people were able to grasp his economics. Exactly. So this question of the development or the evolution of a market order, if you want, or a state mm -hmm. that upholds property rights, yes. security, justice, well, the foundation of markets, essentially. Yes. How, how did that come about um, in Smith's view? Well, Smith has a lot to say about this, and that, that's why uh, book three of The Wealth of Nations is both wor worth reading as well as uh, 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 on the, t the very theme of The Wealth of Nations. So part of the wealth of nations begins with the economics. Books one and two is about the uh, markets, division of labor, microeconomics, uh, capital accumulation, and, and that. Book three then is about the politics. And it's as if Smith is saying, uh, 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 look, the economics part of this is easy. You just need capital accumulation and the division of labor. What's hard is what holds us back is politics. And so book three is about the feudalism and the escape from feudalism. Feudalist, that's interesting. And what's his view on this? How did Europe essentially, I guess, uh, escape from this yes. well, inefficient system that existed for a long time? Yes, I want to emphasize that last part. It yeah. existed for a long time, many centuries. So this was a very low or, or no growth society. And, exactly. Uh, structured in what I call the, the violence trap. And Smith is very clear that violence is a big part of the problem. And there's violence among the lords, between the lords and the king, between the lords and their servants. Uh, and as a consequence of the violence, uh, people are not able to grow and husband their resources. Could you explain a little bit more the violence trap? What do you mean by this? Well, the violence trap is the notion that um, violence is at once self-reinforcing. And that is that the violence itself makes it very difficult uh, for people to invest. So one of the things he talks about for example, is the, the fact that if you, st if you husband your resources, you save, uh, you invest, this is the typical way in which economies grow. Economists have studied this since Adam Smith, in fact. Uh, the problem with this is that in the feudal system with all the violence is that you stand out as a target, that you become attractive for somebody to come take what you have. Someone may steal it, confiscate it. Yes. Um, that and affects incentives. Yeah. Yes, and that affects incentives. And so Adam Smith says as a consequence of these incentives, 
the best thing somebody can do is keep their head down, not invest, and eat as much as possible and work as little as possible. This sounds highly relevant for the developing world, <laughs> and perhaps even the, the West well, nowadays, the developed world. You know? I think so, certainly the developing world today. Yeah. You know, but let's come back to that. How mm -hmm. did, uh, according to Smith now again, uh, this violence trap of the feudal society disappear? Or how was it escaped from? How did yes. the world escape from this? Yes. Well, Smith is very clear about this in, in, in book three. Um, and he talks about the, uh, uh, the rise of the towns. So one of the things that occurs over time is that there's growing scarcity. They, people are cutting down trees to build various structures, and after a while there are fewer and fewer trees, and the price of lumber, which in the beginning of the feudal society is not priced, uh, becomes expensive. And so mm -hmm. it becomes cheaper to get trees from elsewhere, to buy trees from elsewhere. The problem is, is that in order to have trade, this kind of long distance trade, say bringing trees from mm -hmm. Sweden uh, and during the Middle Ages to, to Germany, uh, or, or the Low Countries or uh, uh, the like. In order to do that, you needed to have protection. Property rights. Property rights, yeah. yes. And again, protection from predation of the lords. And so there was a great problem with predation on, on the lords sure. and the king. So the next step is really a, a matter of political exchange between the king and, 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 and the traders against the... Uh, uh, so you have three actors. You have the lords. Yes. You have the king, the royalties, and mm -hmm. then you have the traders in towns, I guess. Yes. And they're, of course, very small and not very important in the beginning. Uh, but as they make this exchange for the king, which is basically for civil liberties on the one hand, uh, for in exchange for tax revenue to the king, um, they're able to create their own laws, create their own markets and trade, and as well as build walls and create uh, their own militia. And the important thing about the walls and the militia is that this gives them the, uh, the ability to defend themselves against the lords. So looting and stealing and all this tends to disappear after time. Here. Yes. And that creates a virtuous circle of, of progress, I guess. Yes. Um, and you can see that in many steps. So one of the things that happens is uh, 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 peasant agriculture is, is, is largely self-sufficient. And self-sufficient means almost no division of labor. Mm -hmm. And if there's no division of labor, you're not doing anything that's skilled. And, and so you're barely at subsistence. And so part of what the towns do is they extend their security umbrella into the neighboring countryside. And this allows the peasants to begin to specialize in things like crops, food for the, food for the town, and raw materials for the manufacturing in the town, or for export, for long-distance trade. And this allows the, uh, uh, the virtuous circle because the security umbrella expands. Uh, that, that makes the countryside more rich. The richer countryside supplies more material to the city in cheaper ways. The city's able to engage in more long-distance trade. That's profitable. And so the city umbrella expands and it starts over again. And so this means that around the big cities you get these great market areas. That are protected from. So when property rights are strengthened, liberty is strengthening your words, or justice. Uh, yes. Market starts to work, commerce starts to develop, wealth starts to be created, yes. and that starts this virtuous circle. Yes. I like to think about it in terms of uh, three simultaneous revolutions. Okay. We've covered all the three pieces, but it's important to say them again in this context. So the first uh, revolution is liberty, the creation of laws and security, property rights. Exactly. Uh, the second is the creation of markets, the generation of wealth, and then the third is security, the ability to defend yourself. And these go together, them. more or less. Yes. yes. And by this process, the violence trap is somehow escaped them. Yes. Yes. I think it's the three simultaneous revolutions of security, markets, and... Uh, this is a fascinating theory of economic development, mm -hmm. but it's not well known, I think. Uh, no. What's I, the implications of this for... Well, say the World Bank, the IMF, or <laughs> aid agencies. Can, that let, can we deal with those two parts <laughs> in sequence? So part Please one, do. Please part do. one is what does this mean for development, and part two is What's what does this mean relevance? for relevance? Yeah, please. Relevance. Please. So this is uh, a new way of thinking about development. So development has is, is been a very odd topic in the sense that economists have long understood or had a way of thinking about economic development. It had to do with production of greater... Um, 
uh, greater per capita income. And so savings and all, so much of economics is devoted to understanding how that process works. On the other hand, there has never been a real understanding of what political development means and what is the role of political development with respect to economic development and how does so economic economists have disregarded the importance of political development yes. for, for economic development. Yes. That's a very basic and fundamental insight, I think. Yes. yes. And especially in the context of violence that we've been talking about. Right, if violence, I, I remember I said at the outset, one of the biggest things missing in economics is the theory of violence, true, the margin true. of violence. And so if m violence is part of, and, and the violence trap is part of the problem of economic development, development more, more generally, then we need to think about how to bring in concerns of political development that parallel the, nece the necessary changes in economic development. And this is true. In today's world, just as well, it was relevant in the yes. feudal society. And Absolutely. We have this violence that emerges or erupts all over, and, yes. and that stifles development yes. and investments and markets mm -hmm. and so on. So uh, coming over to the real world here, uh, Africa, Latin America, many countries have a problem to get development going, really. Yes. Uh, you also studied this empirically, and, and it's part of your lecture here. And, yes. and uh, can you briefly tell me about this? Well, one of the important things to know is we've done studies about the frequency of violence. Frequency and, of violence. And okay. in particular, the violent turnover of leadership of countries. Uh, when there's violent turnover of leadership of countries, often the rules totally change. The so think about. Chile in 1973, there's a coup from the military against the democratically elected socialist government. Uh, and so the d democratic part is totally set aside and the nature of the rules change very dramatically. Uh, What's the effect on the markets or trade or commerce on this? Yes. Well, in general, the, the expectation of this kind of a problem means that there's um, reluctance to make investments, just as sure. Adam Smith sure. talked about. So it's basically the same problem as the feudal society yeah. had, but applied to today's world. Yeah. And uh, how can actors in today's world help these countries to, to escape the violence yes. trap? Well, that's a difficult issue. And Very I, difficult. I think we have to potentially acknowledge the fact that not every place may be able to, to develop. But walking backwards from that very pessimistic view, I think that there are places that can be helped. And so one of the things that I think is important, again, going back to the notion about economists not understanding violence, is what, what economists see is the, the, the political manipulation of markets in developing societies, and often to create privileges and rents and market intervention, things called, that economists call market intervention. And so they rightly suggest that this really disrupts the competitive market process and sure. holds back wealth the wealth production. What they don't see is that why, what's the reason that these uh, exist in the first place? Exist, yeah. Yes, the rents exist in the first place. And the answer is in part because to stem the problem of violence. When there are, are multiple sources of violence. So corruption, bribes, nepotism, these kind of things that exist in our developing countries yes, is in a sense a natural result of, of uh, attempts to avoid a more violent and disastrous yeah. situation. Yes. So one way to think about the nature of rent creation in this and privilege creation, corruption, is that it is serving a particular purpose, and that is helping to provide peace. Because if the rents and the privileges are targeted to those who have violence potential, then it's possible to make them better off cooperating rather than fighting. And so that's part of the reason that developing countries are structured the way they are. But of course, that's part of the violent trap because on the one hand, these interventions and manipulation of the economy is reducing the, po the probability of violence. On the other hand, it's controlling markets and the engine of growth. And so the economists come along and say, well, this is market intervention, get rid of that. What they're doing is really saying, not get rid of market intervention, get rid of the means that provides peace. And so nobody, no, very that's, few. That's a trap, yeah. <laughs> and that's the trap. Very that's few countries do this. But as the example of, uh, well, the escape from feudalism, uh, it is possible actually to, to escape yes. the trap. And uh, the key is to get this virtuous circle uh, yes. moving, really. You know, mm -hmm. And, and uh, 
slowly strengthening property rights, opening up markets, uh, making investments more rational, and, mm -hmm. and get the incentives right. Well, I think, Professor Wangas, that this uh, reconstruction of Adam Smith politics is highly relevant for today's world. And yes. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for your insights. Thank <laughs> you very, very much. Thank you for having me. Great having you here. Thank, thank you. you.